Okay, so we're going to look at the setup and the stages of play for Morn Quest. Setup already is the board uh, for two players, uh, but we're only going to concentrate on the moves and actions of one for the minute. We'll be using your whose character card you can see in the bottom right hand corner. But to go through the components for you, starting at the, the top right, we have the creature standees out. These are the entities that the players will meet on their travels around the Kingdom of Morn and have to defeat in order to be able to carry on their way and complete their quests. We have three different types of tokens which you'll encounter and make use of through the game and we'll come to those uh, at the appropriate time. We have the little pile of resource or charm tokens. These are particularly important as these are the items that the heroes will be trying to gather as they make their way around the board and they will use various quantities of these to lock down the nightmare discs and entrap the nightmare creatures before they can wreak havoc on the world of the real. We have our draw bag and spilling out of that it's already been prepped with the level 1 encounter tiles and it'll be a random draw uh, in the turn of what comes out of that and determine uh, the creatures that you'll find or various moves or treasures that might be placed onto the board. Yours character card then is at the bottom, it shows his health and a record space for the charms they can carry and the cards that he has gathered and has in play to improve himself. The three tokens are skill tokens and these can be spent at any time by the player up to three occasions to make use of the character's special skills that allow them to do little cool things outside their normal abilities. Moving across to the three decks of cards, there's two full decks and then one has just been started with a face-up card. The middle deck is called the surplus. This is where you will discard cards too, but it's called surplus because other players have the opportunity to perhaps take a card from the top of that if it's something that's useful to them. So it's surplus to you and it might be a requirement of somebody else. The green backed cards are relics. These are powerful items which can help the heroes in their quest. And the blue backed cards are equipment items that equally can help but maybe just aren't as powerful as the relics tend to be. To the left hand side we can see the stat cards for all the creatures that can be encountered and it gives the various strengths and weaknesses and the damage that they will do and what damage is required to take them out of commission. The dice at the top, better explained when we're actually making use of them, suffice to say that you'll be employing those in your turn uh, and they will help determine success and failures and also how far the nightmare discs will turn. And then the little red discs with the golden cross are wound markers. The four nightmare creatures then are the Dillahan, the Banshee, the Mero and the Changeling. Currently they are under control of the Shimnivore. And as the players make their way around the board collecting charms in order to lock down the discs, they are trying to cast out uh, these nightmare creatures, uh, banishing them. From the Shimnivore's control. Should the discs ever lock into their final position, the nightmare creatures will be able to roam free and wreak havoc through the Kingdom of Morn. The last thing you would do before you start gameplay is to decide what difficulty level you're going to set for yourself and your fellow players. This is simply done by the positioning of the nightmare discs themselves. Position 1 is the easiest. Position 2 is the more normal uh, position to start your first game in and position 3 offers the most challenge to players once they're familiar with the rules. This of course reduces the amount of time and the amount of turns potentially available for the nightmare discs to be turned to their final closed position, locking them in and freeing the nightmare creatures end of the real world. In your turn then you have three actions and you can use these in a number of ways. We could move one in this case to the granite location and as a second action choose a granite 
place it on our charms. And we would still have an action left. And the best thing to do from here would probably be go to a Nexus location. On a Nexus, you can use a free action to draw an equipment card. We'll draw one up. There we go. And along the bottom of our card, we have the position that we can slot this in and improve our stats. In this case, we have drawn a card that allows us to improve our courage ability. There's space for three cards and you simply slot the appropriate card underneath into its home, which reveals only the number which you'll add to give you a combined courage value. Later on, as we obtain other cards, we'll be able to swap them out and we'll be able to fill these other spaces belonging to strength and magic if we're fortunate enough to acquire cards relevant to those. Just to exemplify uh, how a card can be changed, in this instance, we have swapped and given uh, your a six value card. If in a subsequent turn, as it's shown, he has found himself at another nexus point and was fortunate enough then to draw something like the eight card or any card of a higher value than the one he's currently got. He can simply swap that card out and the removed card then goes on to the surplus deck so that somebody else can take advantage of it if it's relevant to them. There is a special tunnel on the board, the Dunnywater Tunnels. And a move to them, in this case, again exemplifying from starting, one, two, it would be a free move to go automatically to the opposite end of that tunnel system. And you'd be able to carry on your remaining action and move on, or do whatever else was appropriate. Placing charms, in this case, when you would have the movement to take him to the keystone position, which is in line with the nightmare disc, he simply spends an action, take whatever resource is relevant, and place it on. That's that job done, and he can proceed on to try and collect the other charms that are required to lock down this particular disc. When you reach the point of placing the final required resource or charm onto a nightmare disc, you have locked that disc down completely and you have banished that nightmare creature. At that point, the nightmare creature is removed from the disc and you get one of the rare talisman tokens. That's placed on. And at any point now in the game, any player can avail of that talisman token and spend it for a free reroll. Though it's probably suggested that these are banked and kept for the final battle with the Shimnivore. That's probably where you're going to need them most. Okay, so at the end of a player's turn, the moon moves. That's simply achieved by sliding them in a space and then you'll roll the dice for the nightmare discs these have compass facings on them or a blank now, there's a couple of different things can happen here you will roll up a particular compass face whichever face shows that disc will move one space if it's not already locked out bad example because what you're seeing here is this disc locked so what we're going to do there is we're just going to remove those tokens to keep it right for you okay so if in this instance we had ruled the south this nightmare disc would have moved one space now uh, the game does ramp up its difficulty because once the moon has completed one full cycle it will flip over onto its red side for its next pass at that point you'll start rolling two dice double the danger double the fun and don't think at that instance that if you were, like our friend down here, locked out, uh, you get off easy by rolling him and, say, the East chap here. 
because what ends up happening is in a situation where one of the discs is already uh, locked the east one here moves as we expect but the southern discs move passes on and our friend over here would actually turn around and if you've been unfortunate enough to roll two souths at this point that guy will be moving twice yeah back spindle they like to make it easy for you at the end of all the players turns then it becomes the creature's turn now if there were creatures already on the board at this point they would get a move but where we're sitting at the minute, there's not. So this is where your exciting black bag of mystery comes into it. And you draw out for each of the compass points on the board, one of the encounter tiles. Now in level one, there's no movement uh, tiles in this. It'll be treasure or creatures. So the first one out is indeed treasure. And you take a treasure token and it goes on the crossroads. Treasure tokens always go on the crossroads. Next tile out is, oh, lucky boy, another treasure token. And on it goes. And the next one, ah, finally a creature. We get a bug bean. So it's time for one of our standees. And they go on the nexus point at the corner. Tactic for you. If a player character occupies the nexus point at this stage in the game, that bug bean doesn't get placed he gets discarded doesn't get to come on because the space is occupied and the last one drawn is another bug bean goes in the northwest and again on to the nexus point it's also worth pointing out here these tiles don't go away until what they refer to goes away so if these things all stayed in the board through the full next round of the game and we came to this stage again after all the players have gone Nothing would get drawn and nothing would get placed because the four cardinal points are already occupied by someone. So they don't stack. It doesn't sort of escalate that way. But if we had removed in our turn one of the treasures, that token would then get discarded. And subsequently, in the next draw phase, something could come out and replace that. Okay, so let's look at combat. Combat happens generally one of two ways. One, an enemy will move into your space and engage in a fight with you, or you'll move into their space and engage with a fight with them. That's the preferred method, because it can be very uh, disadvantageous to you if they get to engage the fight. In the creature's phase, they will get a move. So in this case, our bugbeam friend is one space away from your, so he would move in. The next thing to do is look and see what phase the moon is at. In this case, it's at gray. So another player will take the bugbeam card and will go to the gray level and they will attack, because they have started the fight, they will get to attack with their strongest skill. In this case, it's courage 11. Now, fortunately, in our example here, our friend Yur has a courage of eight and four. So he's pretty good at the minute. However, chance is still a factor, and at level one, you get one dice, the level one dice. This has to be rolled as well, and that's added to your skill. Be warned, though, that a blank face is a fumble. And if you're rolling one dice, uh, that's an automatic fumble you've missed and the bug bean will get to carry out his preferred thing which is to deprive you of a charm and they will run away they leave the board that's it they don't like to stay around and fight they will scarper off back to their pantry with their goods on the other hand you may be lucky you might win purely on the numbers that you've got or you might roll an automatic win the dandelion is an automatic win in which case you've whopped him and he'll still disappear off and you suffer no ill effects as a result of that now it wouldn't be worthwhile having a fight if there wasn't some little advantage to you as well in this case if you've managed to defeat this bugbean he is carrying 
a charm. In this case, it's one blackthorn. So you will also get that if you've got space to carry it. Of course, as we've said, the preferred method of combat with any of the enemies is for you to choose the time and place to engage with them. In this case, you move into their space. Uh, again, you'll look at the moon as we have before to see what level they will be uh, defending you on. But you get to choose which of your abilities is the best to tackle them with. And combat proceeds as we've outlined before. You'll total up your numbers, you'll roll the appropriate dice, add the value to it, and hopefully you will gain victory. In this case, we have gained victory because we chose to go with our courage. We rolled a three. He is defeated, and that's him gone. The reward for defeating him was a blackthorn. And now we still have an action left. We've done a move, we've done a combat. And if you look in this case, we are on a charm space, so we can avail ourselves of lifting that charm as well. You're as fully loaded, and it's time for him to head off and get some of those charms, uh, helping to lock in some nightmare creatures. Combat with a nightmare is not the ideal thing that you want to have to get involved with, but obviously it is a likelihood of the game. The nightmare creature combat works pretty much the same way as fighting any of the enemies. But the difference is these guys will not just take one hit and run away. They are after all nightmare creatures. And they have three wound spaces. And you need to be able to defeat uh, any of the nightmare creatures three times on each of their abilities. Ideally this will happen at a point in the game where you have already managed to unlock uh, a couple of the better dice for yourself and you will have also hopefully been working diligently to improve your own abilities and get some cards in there that are going to give you a half decent score as well. The phase of the moon is even more important to bear in mind here because that still determines uh, the ability level of the nightmare creature. Now there are a couple of little things that can work in your favour. I mean, you can go in for the, the straight fight and hope that you get lucky. And if you roll good stat or roll good dice and you're able to take them out, say on your second action, one to move in, second one to fight, and you manage to take them out on, say, courage. You might as well spend your third action to have a go at one of your other ability levels. Because bear in mind, if you move away, you're only going to be able to move one. These folks can all normally move too, so they're going to catch up with you and give you a walloping. So look at what you've got, plan an attack in conjunction with your teammates, uh, and look at the phase that the moon's at to try and time that well. There is a little bit of a, a, a boon for players. The blue moon. The blue moon is Cobb's birthday, and any time you are fighting on the blue moon, there is a bonus for yourselves and you get double value on your dice rolls. You still need to watch out for fumbles though because if you get a fumble, that's your turnover. And uh, yeah, get ready for a world of hurt. Now, there are four dice in the game. Uh, level 1, level 2, level 3 and level 4. And it's very important that you're aware of how you get these. You will start with the grey level 1 dice. Though, let's just be cautious. The Kickstarter might change the colours of the dice. But we'll stick with the colours that we've got to hand here at the minute. So the grey level 1 dice. If you successfully cast out one of the nightmare creatures, you will get access to the level 2 dice. If you successfully cast out the third, a second one, you will get the level three. And if you successfully cast out the final one, you'll get access to the level four. Now, why am I saying access to rather than yourself? Because at any time you only get to roll three dice. So there are choices to be made. The chances of what comes up, you, you will be best suited to decide at the, the time which dice to use. The only other way to get those dice 
is if you haven't locked out the nightmare creatures and they have managed to escape into the kingdom of Morn, you will have to defeat them in combat. And once defeated, you will be able to unlock the dice. Do bear in mind that if a nightmare gets out and you're still on level one grey dice, you're fighting a nightmare creature with one dice. Just think about that for a second. So focus, okay? Teamwork and cooperation and get the job done because I've tried fighting them with one dice and it doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work well, it's not easy. There are a couple other little fancy bits about the dice themselves. For example, we've got uh, a five hit on that one and there is a double damage award on this one. So a combination of that being rolled is uh, combined with your uh, appropriate skill in the fight is certainly going to be a good advantage to you. May the dice roll in your favour. So our mysterious draw bag of encounter tiles. What happens there? Well, if, and I say if, when is the better word, when you deplete all the enemies that are in the bag, it is time to ramp it up, at which point uh, level two tiles will go in. Now level two includes slightly tougher different creatures, these are just a couple of examples, and it will also include additional uh, enemy movement cards. It'll still work the same way. Whenever you draw them, they're placed following the exact same rules, but in this case, if a movement uh, tile is drawn, the enemies will get that movement. If you draw several movement tiles in a row, the enemies on the board will get all that movement as well. So, defeat a nightmare creature, either in combat or by casting it out, and you will add, at whatever point that is, the level 2 creatures to it. Or if you have depleted the bag, you will add the level 2 creatures to the bag. There's level 1, there's level 2, and there's level 3. You'll be glad to hear there's no level 4 yet. Um, so it gets harder, it gets more challenging, but it, it, does, it does level off for you. Now, we're painfully aware that so far it's kind of sounded like you're maybe on a little bit of a back foot uh, in terms of fighting these guys. There's an awful lot going on in Morn Quest. You have a lot of things you're expected to do between gathering the charms and fighting uh, the, 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 the bog beans and whatnot. And of course, the nightmares trying to lock them down and banish them. Don't overlook the treasure pots because the treasure pots are an access to the ancient relics. And the ancient relics are very powerful. And they, they can make a huge difference uh, in what you're able to do. Their power is, as it suggests, potentially unlimited. There's a range of them out here for you to just get a, a quick look at, but you can do a number of things. There's ones that allow you to roll all the dice. You normally only have a maximum of three dice, so there's a relic that allow you to roll all four. There's a relic that allow you to change the time. You can move them in. There's a relic that will allow you to move a nightmare disc back or forwards. Um, so there's a whole host of optional strengths and powers there. You are obviously focused on trying to gather the charms, but don't underestimate it's a free action to lift uh, the pots, the magic pots, and these are one-off items usually uh, you get one shot with. Some of them, uh, a rare few, you'll get to use multiple times. But it would be a foolish uh, adventurer that didn't take the opportunity to gather up uh, the pots when they can, because the power of them particularly if you are going to have to engage in combat with the nightmares, is uh, the thing that could swing it very much in your favour. Now, a creature turn when you have a nightmare out, and especially if you have uh, leveled up uh, the cards, the encounter tiles, can be particularly treacherous. At the start of the creature turn, you have their movement. So anyone that's on the board gets a move. In this case, we've got our little nightmare friend. He's got a move of two. 
So he drops into there. And our little friend over here gets a move of one. He drops down to there. Now it is the Nightmare Creature's special abilities. And they've all got a different one. The Banshee in this case is a Wailing Howl, as you might expect. And any hero within two spaces can only take two actions that turn. And where our friend currently is positioned is within that for these two heroes that are on the boards. They are automatically reduced to two actions. Now, we're drawing tiles. Bear in mind, we've already got a couple of tiles out, so there will be none drawn for those spaces. So the southeast is the first one that would get one. And let's just say, for sake of argument, we're very unfortunate, and we get a movement tile. Okay? Everyone would get movement again automatically. Now this would be enough in this case for our friend here to move into combat with our chum. This chap would move down but the Banshee would also move in and he would go into combat. So in the Nightmare or in the, the creature turn you have movement, you have the Banshee's own ability or the sorry any of the Nightmare creatures that are out special ability. You then have the creature combat, the normal one, so if any of them had moved into that. Then you do your tiles, so potentially, as in this case, if the tile comes out with more movement and the movement allows them to come into contact with the hero, you would have additional combat. Just to give an example of another scenario uh, with the, the creature phase, tile comes out for movement. If, in this example, our bug beam was already in combat with one of our heroes and an additional movement came into play. The nightmare in this case moves down, one of a go our hero. A space can only be occupied by two. The bug beam will be equally terrified of the nightmare and he will run away, uh, leaving the nightmare to have the fight with the hero character. The end game situation comes about when the Blood Moon has completed its uh, circumnavigation of the centre of the board. As it comes into position, technically, I suppose if you like, you can say the moon flips again. It's gone right round red and it will be time for it to flip. This brings about the summoning of the Shimnivore. Uh, Shimnivore is a real nightmare creature. His objective is to destroy the Morn Wall, which is keeping him imprisoned. Now, as the board currently sits, the players have an awful job ahead of them. Because until any remaining nightmare creatures or other enemies that are on the board are dispensed with, you cannot attack the Shimnivore himself. So in this instance, the Banshee would still need to be defeated and our little bog bean friend would still need to be defeated. Now the other players, if, if it's my turn and I've moved the moon, uh, out he comes. He won't do anything yet. The other players in the game will still get to carry out their turns. But at the next creature phase, he will commence attacking the wall. Now in a one, two player game, he will get one attack. In a three player up game, he will get two attacks. He can still roll blanks, which means he won't actually manage to do any damage. But should he do any damage, then broken wall tokens will go in the key points around to represent him smashing down the Morn Wall. There are things that you can do to try and prevent that. There are relics available that can try and help save the day. And it's probably worth mentioning, this is an ideal situation where the trading posts that exist in the game might come into play. If you have come into this part of the game now and you've dealt with the, the other uh, Nightmare Discs, Chances are some of the players will still have uh, charms on their cards. You can go to one of the trading posts and the trading posts have an exchange rate value where you can trade X number of um, charms. I think it's three. 
to draw an additional relic card. So obviously if there's no treasure pots floating about or they're coming into short supply, it might be an economic move for one of the players to head around trying to gather up more charms and then trade those off in the hope of getting useful relics. If, however, you have managed to clear the board, then the points around the Morn Wall are the points at which you can launch your attacks on the Shimnivor himself. Now, you no longer will be drawing from the bag in counter tiles. This, this is the end game. It, it doesn't need to get any harder. However, the Shimnivor is one tough cookie. And just as the Nightmares had wounds to be taken down, the Shimnivor needs to be defeated in each of his ability areas twice uh, before you can defeat the Shimnivor and claim victory. It will not be a walk in the park. It'll be a walk in the morns. <laughs> Excuse the pun. So, as much as we said earlier in the game, there's a lot going on and you have a lot to do. You need to be gathering up equipment cards and improving the abilities of your characters. You need to be gathering those charms to lock down those nightmare discs. But you also need to be looking carefully at obtaining relics as the game progresses as well. Not only to maybe help you defeat the nightmares, but to be able to stem off the Shimnivore's attack. He will start facing north, and as the player's turn progress, and his turns progress, he will move around the points of the compass, attacking various elements of the wall. If at any point he has destroyed all the sections of the wall, well, I'm afraid it's game over for the players. There are six uh, wall tokens, there are six points for him to destroy, so if there's any six tokens come out, that's it. Enough of the wall has been destroyed and the Shimnivore has escaped. And you are abject failures. You really are and we're shockingly disappointed in you. One of the last things, and I can't believe we didn't mention it earlier, but we'll mention it now. You do have life points, obviously. Health, call it what you will. It's called life points in the, in the rule book. That probably won't change. However, do bear in mind, if at any point any of the players are reduced to no life points, it's game over. It's not you're out of the game, you are undone. Um, life points can be gained a couple of different ways. you for example, is a healer, so he can heal people, including himself. Or you can go to any of the player character's starting points and you can restore life points one per actions that you have not spent. So that's another little thing to just bear in mind. And especially if you're facing the nightmares, you're dealing with the Shimnivore at the end, you want, might want to sort of bear in mind a, a quick nip to restore a few life points uh, might be an advantageous thing to do because it would be heartbreaking to have got this far in the game and through an unlucky stone clopping you in the back of the head, uh, you cost everybody victory.